Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, we have one hearing scheduled before tonight, but before we start, uh, is anybody here from the public who has anything to say, any comments, questions on anything that has uh, anything to do with other than the hearing that's about to come before us tonight? No? Okay, then we will start the proceedings tonight with a, what was scheduled at, for 7 o'clock, um, for a site plan amendment to expand the parking lot at 766 mm -hmm. North King Street, Northampton Map ID. 821. And we have a presentation. From yep. Hi, good evening. My name is Jeff Elion. Um, I guess the uh, manager, one of the owners of the building, but also the general manager of Pioneer's Fine and Sports Positions, which is um, the second floor tenant of the building. There's two other tenants. Um, Dr. Mary Pat Roy and Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates. Uh, building's been in existence for I think about six or seven years. I forget exact date. Um, we've uh, we built the building you know, for the use that it's being um, uh, used now. Uh, the issue is is that we just want to. We've got the accessible land. Um, when we built the building, we had a total of 49 spaces, 33. Uh, general use and six handicapped parking spaces. Um, and over the last seven years, the businesses have somewhat grown, but um, more than anything, we just want to use the available land that we have there um, just to increase accessibility and convenience for the patients that use that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of simple. I mean, we've got the, the land is there. We're not looking to, uh, to do any blasting. We're not looking to bring any big excavations. We've got a, a small piece of land about 12 feet to the back that is already leveled. There's already two catch basins there. All we're looking to do is just um, when we repave the lot, which we're planning on doing in the spring, we just want to push back about 12 feet just to increase um, and pick up between we're hoping between six to ten reality is we'll probably pick up about eight parking spaces. And again, it's just for the convenience of our patients. Um, just so the board does know, we've looked at every alternative. Uh, there's the Sunoco station next to us. We've approached them on three different occasions. They have quite a bit of land that they don't use. We ask them to lease. Uh, lease us their spots, rent us spots, um, but they refuse to, uh, to let us use any of the land there for parking. Um, we did look at trying to um, have our employees and the employees of the building shuttle to another site so there's more patient <laughs> parking, but the reality is that that's not convenient and, and it's really not safe and ideal. So, um, and ultimately we decided that we needed to redo the parking lot. It's uh, this winter particularly, it's taken a beating with, uh, with the conditions. Um, so when we do repave it in the spring, we're just looking to expand to the land that we already have. Um. Yeah, a couple questions. You started when it was originally constructed, you had 49 spaces? From I believe so, yes. And now uh, it looks like you're shooting for 59? It says 59. The reality is I think it, it'll probably be 50. 57. I mean, I think if we pick up eight more spaces, I think we'll be fine. There is, we're hoping, um, depending on the board tonight, obviously we're hoping that it's approved. Um, I've been in contact with the state of Massachusetts about possibly putting an electric car charging station there. Um, there is some grants available, so I've contacted them. Um, we're trying to, you know, if we're going to do this, we'd like to do it so that it's convenient and make that accessible. So that's one of the um, one of the spots that's taken. It, it looks in like in the middle where the existing parking is now. The new layout, you're trying to squeeze a couple more spots in that, that center. We do have there's a couple of spots that the engineers determined are wider than than they need to be, um, and we've seen that, that so that when we go to repave it, we did say that we could repave it in such a manner that we might be able to pick up a couple of spots. We're not going to do it to the point that, you know, um, that people can't park conveniently. So that's why if we determine that it's just not going to fit, I think the 59 could become 57. The, the convenience uh, factor is the one I, issue I was thinking of because you have typical parking spaces, spaces you have as nine foot width, which is standard. 
but in the middle, it looks like there's maybe eight, seven or eight spaces here that are down to eight and a half. Yeah, and that's so why it, it, um, we may not go that route. Cars or yeah, um, we've got the handicapped parking spaces. Obviously, those are untouchable. We want to pick up a few more. Um, we do see more and more people. Um, one of the uh, things that's being offered now is a pediatric clinic. There's, unfortunately, there is there's uh, Shriners Hospital in Springfield has cut way back on their pediatric services. We have people coming as far as Worcester to be um, with their children to be uh, seen for specialty pediatric, uh, and they do come in a van, so uh, that requires a little bit more space. Uh, we want to make that available. Um, but ultimately, if we determine that those spaces are not as wide as they need to be, and we would mark some out for compact cars, but ultimately, if they're not, then then those spaces would be would be diminished by two to to bring them back up to nine feet. Yes. Just so you know, our, our standard is eight and a There's staff comments on this? Or no, I, I mean, our recommendation is for approval. There's, you know, it's all sort of within the paved footprint except for that little bit behind the building, and um, there's lots of undeveloped land, so there's no issue with open space. And I think we all know that uh, medical office has higher demand for parking and other uses. So that was my only question is what degree of lot coverage is the paved surface? Do you know what it is or what it will be? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the percentage of land that's uh, I don't want to give you the wrong percentage. I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, it's in the, it's probably in the, the uh, application, sorry. Um, the, the lot goes up the hill. There's quite a uh, large hill that like goes up, and we did we did <coughs> actually ex excavate in. The gentleman um, who did the excavation is here. There is no ledge back there. That was one of the considerations, but we did determine that it would be prohibitively expensive to go back into that lot. The retaining wall alone, I think, that's something that big would have been in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and I don't think would have been practical. I don't remember being a concern before we improved it. Um, we've actually reduced the open space um, requirements in HB since then. It was 20% originally, and now it's more just about the buffers and landscaping. So it's, it certainly doesn't, there's no implication in terms of the zoning ordinance. So as it is, you're pushing back into the hillside, building the retaining wall in the back. The retaining wall would only be, uh, if you want to call it that, it's about a three-foot wall. It's basically so people don't just keep driving into the hill. <laughs> Looks like it's a eight foot wall. No, it's uh, I think it's there's a there's one around the side of the building would be um, there's a um, a retaining wall eight foot wall there. The remaining wall that we're pushing back would only be I think, three three four maybe five feet at most. Because it's got a fit, the finished elevation on the pavement of one ninety nine and top of wall elevation of two oh seven along the back of the parking. Of the whole length to us, which it's irrelevant. But that's a good size I think, he, yeah, he put that. I don't know if it'll ultimately be that. I think he, he put that just so that it, that was the most it would be. Mm -hmm. We're hope, certainly hoping it's not going to be that. He told me he estimated it to be about three or four, between three and four feet. Okay. I mean, I didn't have any issues with it other than. Potentially a convenience factory that you can have with spaces, but that's up to them to decide if it works or doesn't work. Will there be any change in lighting? You do no, the lighting is would be the same actually. The, um, the, the, the lights that are there um, actually go out into the hill where we would be anyway, so there's no more, there's, uh, there's no additional lighting that would be required. But you're relocating the lights? We're relocating too, just for convenience to, to get them out of. We do, we've had a couple of instances where tractor trailers on the weekends decide to use our lot to turn around and they've taken out a couple of poles.
Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Okay. Public discussion is closed. <coughs> Any of them? Anyone of you? Frank. Randy. I don't have the sheet. Oh, come on. Oh, oh actually, you have both. She took it. <laughs> you want me to yeah, know. <laughs> this is my final half. Okay, I move to approve the site plan amendment to expand parking at parking lot at 766 North King Street in Lanson, map ID 8 page 21. All in favor? Or any second? Second. second. Okay. All in favor? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice night. Yep, you too. So um, the, everything um, stayed the same from your the draft that you guys already <coughs> reviewed up until bullet point eight and nine. So we've added, so this is, de again, design criteria for um, projects that entail 
seven or more um, units on a parcel. And originally, the, there was a split in the language. If you remember um, the language adopted, there was a split between construction of seven units and construction of 10 units. And this, the, the goal for he, this is just to simplify it and say anything over seven, you have to follow all these criteria instead of um, creating that sort of second tier. So number eight, um, buildings shall um, be either, so there's a laundry list of, of ways to comply with this, um, U.S. Green Building Council lead new construction certified or be U.S. Green Building Council lead new development um, certified um, or 15% of the units, um, I'm sorry, I should go back to, uh, I want to explain A and B before I move on. So there was a lot of discussion and um, Devin, you can probably fill in on that, that people were concerned about making sure that these were, that anytime we were building new bigger projects that they be energy um, efficient to the greatest extent possible. Um, and um, so I, I don't know if this got out of order here. I guess um, C was 15% of the units to meet the zoning definition of affordability or that all buildings should be net zero construction of a PERS rating at zero. Um, or 50% or more of the units are no longer than 1,200 square feet gross mm -hmm. floor area for at least five years from certificate of occupancy. I mean, that's a lot of language about how to structure a unit, but it's sort of a, um, a pick list mm -hmm. um, to try to get at those goals that people were trying to um, you know, reach. Yeah, so I have a comment about the uh, A and B. Uh -huh. um, you know, if it's if if the goal is to to make them as energy efficient as possible, I, I don't know that the lead rating system <coughs> is going to get you there. Um, you can have a lead certified building, you can have a lead gold building, and it can still use a lot of energy. So, one other issue I have with with the municipality you know, having this as a requirement, I, I mean, I know it's an or, but, but still, and it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, conversation out there about, about a municipality or anyone requiring lead certification when U.S. Green Building Council is a private industry, it's a private company, mm -hmm. so you're making people <laughs> give money to a private company, mm -hmm. so there's, there's yeah. issues there. I might suggest maybe saying that it has to be <coughs> such a percentage over the stretch code, you know, the stretch code. Yeah. It might get you maybe more where you want to be. Yeah. I think that's a good thought. I mean, there ha well, actually was conversation in that meeting about whether, I mean, lead is sort of the only industry standard now for mm -hmm. that, but there are, but just like you said, just because you have lead points doesn't mean you're really totally energy efficient. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a whole bunch of other ways to increase your carbon footprint, even if you have lead points. Yeah. Right. Like fast food restaurants, for example, that happen to be lead certified. <laughs> One way around that, because I'm, I am a, a lead approved person that's never done it. Mm -hmm. And the demanding that it be certified is an awful mm -hmm. lot of paperwork when it doesn't literally change the building. Right. So it, there might be a way that we could say follow the guidelines of. That, that is equivalent. Yeah. Equivalent? Uh, equivalent? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a lead AP and I have done a, a lead build. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. But, uh, and, and a lot of a lot of projects do decide for, for the amount, you know, to uh, save money or the paperwork to say you're certifiable. But again, I don't know that that's getting you to being a highly energy efficient. Well, isn't that less than the stretch code in some cases? Or I think the stretch code incorporates that. I think the stretch code, using what we have, the stretch code maybe doing a little more than that is the avenue to go down versus, I had an issue with the, with the, the lead as well because almost by default now, good design is sustainable design. It might not be it might be at, on a par with lead uh, certification, but the process of getting certified 
is a, is an arduous one. It can take several months, and there's a cost that goes to that, and it doesn't necessarily increase the sustainable design or, or the you know the, the amount of energy that the building uses. So, um, yeah, I think the focus should be more on, on what the city has to work with, with stretch codes and so forth, versus versus an actual certification. Um, what what do you think would be a, um, maybe a comparable or goal for um, stretch code for you know if we could do a percentage over that what how would, have you thought about yeah. what language that would be yeah well I I I could look into it I, I don't know fifteen percent comes to mind I'm not sure where I'm pulling that from you guys from from here yeah, it's hard to define. You know, we could talk to a, a HERS grader, too, would probably have a good idea. Um, and so how would that relate to that next one that you talked about that offer a, the option of bringing your HERS rating down to... Well, net zero, well, you know, God bless the developer. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> 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 Well, I mean, it, yeah, we, we actually hear more and more people talking about wanting to achieve that goal in their development um, scheme. So I don't know. It seems to me that that might be, you know, that's coming going to become more frequent or more frequent goal. Frequent um, goal, I can see. More frequent, I can't see. I mean, not just not now, not yeah. in the immediate future. Okay. Um, what kind of car do you drive? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Could you be driving one that's significantly more efficient? I mean, it seems to me that some of these requirements are a little on the harsh side compared to what you would get if you were building a private house. But, I mean, I, I think it's an ideal goal. But um, if you really want to take it all the way, you should just require zero carbon footprint. Well, I, I think the lead certification is the only part. And I don't think it, it, that in and of itself gets what the intent is to, to, to right. achieve. Right. And the certification costs, just, just to send them the dues yeah. for it, the thousands of dollars you've right. been putting into energy saving right. devices. Right. There's no, I mean, there's no incentive. There's very little incentive for the developer or anyone. Um, it's a very limited lead certification. Incentive other than a nice plaque on the wall or for marketing or so forth. It doesn't change the design, it doesn't change anything, it's just a certification. There's some public buildings, libraries, and so forth. There are programs that if you reach a certain level of lead certification, you get you get money back. And that's great. Um, but that doesn't apply here. And it's it would be hard to make that requirement. I don't I, 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 I don't agree that we should make that requirement because it's mm -hmm. unduly hard. Um, but I don't know if that's so looking at this as, as uh, you know, a developer, is when does like some jump out at you that like, oh, this is this is the easy one, this is a little hanging fruit that everyone's going to pick. Like, if it's not truly equal options, then maybe there's something doing that. Because people are always going to pick the same. Right. I mean, the net zero is not the option people are going to go to. Mm -hmm. They're not going to go toward lead certification, mm -hmm. and so that you know you end up with a small gross mm -hmm. uh, footprint. Um, or the affordable housing, and, and those right. two things that are sort of alternative versions of themselves. I mean, smaller so places. It can be. It can be. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, I, I think a, a percentage, uh, you know, uh, energy efficiency over the stretch code. I think that's realistic, mm -hmm. and I think it's what I think it's what you you, you do in the energy section of leads. Um, so so I think that could that could serve. Almost what, what you're trying to get at in A and B, mm -hmm. and have it be a viable option. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Absolutely. Truly, I mean, these days it doesn't take much design effort to reach a design that's certified without going through the whole process, because it just makes sense from a building and, and future maintenance standpoint to have something with and high R values and a building envelope and so forth. How does that compare to stretch code? Like surpass a lead, a lead, cer lead certified. It, it'll, it will meet or surpass the stretch code, but we could we could take a percentage and try to figure out 
what percentage is a goal that's achievable that will that will be better than just baseline stretching the code, but is it but is yet achievable mm -hmm. without being burdensome. It, yeah, in fact, may, maybe we refer to the that, that lead section uh, in energy uh, research and and see what those points are for what the percentage of savings is, and then we'll pick something out of that. Okay, I'm just wondering if then maybe we could use that as sort of as a benchmark for what that percentage of stretch code would be. Mm -hmm. So we could do some more work on that mm -hmm. to see what the comparison is. Mm -hmm. Then you're not worried about brown water and you know, that you sliced out that piece that you're trying to get to. Yeah. Um, now it's the time to have the conversation of can we, if, if we as a community have set stretch code as our building target, which we have, then can we pick a certain place in the, in the statutes and say, well, we want more than that? I mean, is there any, well, I don't know, that's a naive question. No, no, it's not. I mean, zoning can't regulate what's normally regulated under the building code. So, you know, stretch code is clearly building code um, regulation. This is special permit, so that's why we can't dictate what, how you build because we can't we can't cross that path, but so because it's a special permit and you're asking for these sort of additional things, then we have more flexibility to say, here's some options we really we need to consider, you know, that have to do with energy efficiency. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Um, so okay, well we can take a look at that. I can talk with um, the building commissioner and see what um, his take is. Yeah. permits filed under this provision may be submitted for review and approval prior to and separately from a fully engineered site plan so long as the following items are identified in a preliminary site plan with a special permit application and full detailed engineered site plans are filed for review and approval prior to commencement of, of construction. So this is sort of, um, this is trying to enable applicants to go through and sort of see what they're, whether or not they're going to be able to get a special permit for the board before they spend thousands right. of dollars right. on an engineer plan. I've already been this before. Yes. Yeah. And since we haven't, uh, like you said, we've had that issue before, but we haven't really specified um, <coughs> what, how it's allowed, whether it's allowed, and so there's always been this gray area about whether you can do it first or you have to do it later. So um, this sort of makes it legal in this context to say you can go first with your special permit so long as we have the following things identified and then you can come back later for your very um, fully engineered special plan. Um, and then those um, items would, for the initial review, would be roadway and driveway alignment, um, Showing standards with the connect, showing compliance with the connectivity standards that were identified um, in items one through seven, uh, buffers and preliminary landscape abutting existing neighborhoods, proposed location of park and open spaces, um, building envelopes and location, and anticipated building types and number of units, uh, um, total number of units. Any, in any special permit approval granted with only a preliminary site plan, the board may establish thresholds in which amendment of that special permit is required either prior to or in parallel with review of the fully engineered plan. Um, and again, this is sort of the tighten up um, and almost like a flag or placeholder for the board when they're approving a special permit under these circumstances to specifically identify what's going to trigger an amendment. That recently about an issue about whether or not special permit was, should be triggered, and it's you know it, it can it's not always clear those those points, so that's why we added this proposed language. And then we felt like A through E, the items that you have to submit are really sort of bubble diagrams, maybe a little bit more detailed, so that the neighborhood gets a sense of where things are going to be located, what the total number of units are going to be. Where's the um, where are the open space areas? Um, you know enough of that information to say does this project make sense? Right. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that, I'm sure it's back. So we've had that issue before where it's just a lot of effort to get an engineer set just to get to find out if you can move forward. You know? Go back to number eight. There's something wrong with the syntax. The building shall, and it says, 50, like number E, I don't know, what does that mean? Building shall 50% or more of the units no longer be open. You mean it's not preferred, is what yeah. you're saying? What? It's not preferred, is what you're saying. Wait a minute, what is it not? What, Mark? The word have should be before 50%. So building shall have or mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So I think all of them need, except the first two. Okay. Okay. Except they're going to change. So we're not going to, oh, this is just in the ordinance form. Yeah. yeah. So it's not quite ready to okay. shift. I'll bring it back to you with that language about the um, stretch code before we send it to council. So I'll have to hurry up and do that. We're getting closer and closer to July. <laughs> um, so did I send you minutes? For the minutes? Once we've got one set of minutes from January 23rd. Yeah. Yep. Lots and lots of things. I knew we approved the minutes in January 23rd, 2014. Second. Second, Jen, all in favor? Oh, we have this too. You guys looked at, did we talk about this before? Mm -hmm. Okay. Was so, it snow out? Was snow out? Yeah. So, um, um, we, we did a street petition. You guys have um, looked at a street petition um, for Cook Avenue mm -hmm. a couple of mm -hmm. meetings ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and that went up to the edge of um, the new old Moose Lodge, which is um, also, there's an easement trail access to this trail right so um, during that conversation, there were a group of property owners back in there off of what is referred to as Boggy Meadow Road, which is really the trail. Um, it's an old woods road back in there. Um, asked DPW if they could just attach that section onto the Cook Avenue request for street acceptance. And Board of Public Works said, no, you can't do that. So <laughs> then they came back and formally petitioned for that dirt path to be um, a street, to become a street. Um, and so it's, it's Boggy Meadow Road. So what you, um, w what I have here is this memo um, from Wayne um, about the street acceptance. And I'll just um, read it into the record. A petition for street acceptance of 316 point two foot portion of a trail known as Boggy Meadows Road was filed with City Council. The Office of Planning and Sustainability recommends against accepting this as a street for several reasons. It has never functioned as a road. This trail has never um, uh, is simply a gravel narrow right of way that abutters have shared rights and access to. Street acceptance is not a substitute for subdivision approval. 
uh, the proper way to make a trail with no history of being a road into a road is to file subdivision approval, build the road to subdivision standards, and then petition for street exception. Um, there's no right of way available, although there are shared rights of access to the trail. Under um, Gerald C. statute, the abutting property owners own to the center line of the trail. And this means that half the trail is owned by the Hampton Conservation Commission, and they have not granted permission to the right of way. And such right of way would require an eminent domain taking and damages. Um, and then finally, um, state legislative approval is required because the land is partially owned by Conservation Commission. It would take an Article 97 amendment to the state constitution for any conversion of conservation land to another purpose. Um, so for those reasons, our office recommends the board that the city council not accept it and certainly that the planning board recommends city council not accept that portion. We had a lot of roads come for us that, that was just based on our opinion. What do you, what do you think? Is it a road? Is it not a road? Without a lot of backup, this seems clear. This yeah. is not a road. If you walk it, you know it's not yeah, a road. It yeah. I've never actually been on it. Are there houses? There must be houses. No, no it's, just not. A, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's just a walking. So who wants it turned into a road? The landowners that abut it further back behind the moose lodge, because then that, once you have a street, then you have frontage, and then you can come in and potentially develop it. Because it's already written into, there's rights of passage. There's conservation property on top of it anyway. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> 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 